A tremendous greeting to you, strong warrior. If you've received this letter, it means that my little helpers were successful in properly tracking down an individual of considerable brawn, fortitude, and wit. Consider this an official invitation to the Arginian Royal Castle for an audience with me, Queen Jade. The meeting will be tomorrow at noon, and try your best to attend and show the guards at the gate this letter. I have a job for you that will pay incredibly well on completion, and we will discuss this in full during the audience. I thank you for your time and look forward to working with you, my brave adventurer. Yours truly, Queen Jade Arginia of the Royal Castle. Well, if there was any ticket back into the castle, this would be it. There's a major problem here, though. I deserted from the military about ten years ago. I have to keep my promise to Dana, that sweet ginger halfling girl. I came here looking for the bounty board and a way to abandon the poor decisions that I made within the last week. Being a bandit? Rumem, what the hell were you thinking? My throat was literally slit, and I was thrown into a ditch. By the gods, if Dana wasn't there, I'd have died. I owe everything to her. Really. I made a large handful of coins during my time at the stables. Turns out it pays pretty well. Might be about time that I clean myself up. You know, by this point I'm about 6'4", and weigh in the upwards of... 250 pounds. My stomach is flat, and my forearms are the width of a club. My signature blonde hair is stringy, and runs past my shoulders to splay out in a frazzled mess. Which, by the way, I'm super self-conscious about all of that. There isn't a single aspect of me that I wouldn't freak out over if somebody complimented me on it. Wow, you're so strong! And I'd say something like, yeah, bread is pretty cool. Never get me wrong, I am shy and scared, and I hold up a scary front so people think that I'm cool. <laughs> Stop that. It'll get me killed. Now, Arginia has a location called the Pentamarket. This is a mercantile hotspot for those who wish to do business and celebrate the various festivities that Arginia has to offer. The name derives from the five roads that come to a point, where a stone statue of a knight represents those who have fallen during the war. The statue is faceless to represent the mass identity of soldiers of war. There are taverns, a famous blacksmith, an apothecary, the world's largest library, a hunter's lodge, and a hospital of sorts. There's also pottery vendors, jewelry stands, and pastry makers. What I mean to say by this is that it's a tourist trap, and I'm too poor to shop here. I will, however, visit a few of the stores around the market to ensure that I look presentable to the queen. Well, with my pockets now basically empty, my hair cut, and my ego inflated, I have spent a total of two hours. Damn. This is going to take a while. I suppose it's a park bench and a bedroll for me. Maybe a drink in between. Depends on what's cheap and what's not water. With any luck, it's both, not just one of those things. And I suppose the fastest way to accomplish my boredom and moving along the rest of my, my day is to skip to the important bits. I spent the last, all of last night polishing my new armor, picking at my teeth, playing cards, and choking down some cheap drink. Arginia is fucking huge. Large enough to the point where 30 miles is something accomplishable and an entire day worth of travel. A whole freaking day. And that's moving at quite the moderate speed. The city is longer than it is wider. More like a semi-oval than a circle. There's a huge wraparound near the Arginian Bay area where the traders and fishermen swarmed the docks. You can see some of the largest ships in your entire life here. I hear that the going rate for reserving dock space is very high. And what I mean to say by this is that I spent many hours walking from the fucking Penta Market to the castle last night. I did not sleep in an inn, as the only commercial taverns near the castle are owned by the high-end aristocracy. I doubt they let me in if I was late. Among notable events along the way, my attention was diverted to a commotion going on near one of the taverns. Being forcefully shoved out of the doors of a fine establishment was a figure that I've never seen before. He was a rather large turtle humanoid that ungracefully battered his feet into the ground to keep balance. Around 5'2", the first thing that I noticed about the creature was his shell. It had an aggressive array of dulled spikes and spines that protrude from the base. 
His face looks strikingly similar th to a theater personality that I've seen on the posters around the Penta Market, Sir Daniel DeVicio. Wide-brimmed glasses and tufts of wiry hair that seem to have been glued on the side of his head. He was followed by a burly-looking butcher, cleaver in hand, and a leather apron blowing gently by the breeze of a pissed-off man. His hair was black, and his beard was full. And don't you waste our fucking time again, trash. The last thing that I noticed is the burly man kicking the turtle humanoid in the chest, sending him flying backwards onto his shell. He let out a, dishe a disheveled yell and struggled to get back onto his feet. His jaw snapped and his arms flailed, essentially throwing a tantrum. The butcher spat at him and slammed the door. The creature took a few more seconds before noticing me and pointing. Can you give me a hand, you shiny little man? I reached my hand out to grab his. It's dry and tough. Furrowing my brow and pushing my nose where it didn't belong, I asked, What are you doing here? I was trying to calm my nerves before going to see the queen, but so much for that. The queen? Yeah, the queen. Some little chicken nugget of a boy squiggled on up to me and said that my shell was neat and gave me a letter. The fancy wax seal didn't taste like my mom's, but I'm sure that you can understand. Anyway, the Queen of Aguinia wants to see me tomorrow because I'm a strong hero or something. Money involved, I'm gonna buy a big tub so I can actually take a bubble bath the right way. Painfully aware of the consequences, I asked him how he bathed before. Well, before, I would climb onto my tub and then my shell would catch on either side of me and I would try to turtle paddle myself all clean, but I just ended up looking like a greasy muffin. Uh, well, that's nice. Um, anyway, I have a letter from the Queen, too. Looks like we met each other early. <laughs> I reach my hand out once more and he returns the gesture dramatically. My name is Rumem. It's nice to meet you. My name is Franklin Stanklin. I read a lot of books and fight a lot of crooks. I lied. I don't fight crooks. Not yet. I'm practicing things to say to people. In fact, I'm pretty good with the sword and I'm pretty good with my brain and my mouth. Magic shit. Know what I'm saying? I'm looking for orange tree. What? Uh, you know what? Never mind. Uh, you're a lot. Let's see if we can find somewhere to sleep for the night. Um, have you eaten? Heck yeah, noodle friend. I have this bag of tree nuts I picked myself. I have a walnut, I have a acorn, I have a peach, I have a metal ball that I suck on every once in a nightly. <sighs> Wonderful. I slept on the ground beneath a tree about 400 feet from the castle. I was woken up and asked to move twice by the night guards. I see this is how they handle the homeless population. Franklin and I were, fortunately, able to sleep the night away and kill the time. I woke up before him and I noticed something strange. While we were sleeping, there was a tiny drop of water coming from atop a building. It was falling directly onto the bottom part of his shell. Franklin's response to this was to gently wiggle back and forth. He was still asleep. Eventually, we did wake up and began our morning rituals. Just enough time before we all met at the castle moat. It seems the sun has yet to steal the morning dew. Light push-ups, arm stretches, that's what I did. Franklin stood up and body slammed a tree. Oh, but goodness. That one really hit my totally spot. I've been uh, itching all dang night on that one. I ignored him. I suppose this would be something I would tune out in the end, but for now, I cannot. I suppose that Franklin is somewhat of a friend now. We would be on the same mission from the Queen. We both gather our gear and made our way to the castle. The morning smells of freshly worked iron and lavender permeate the air. The metals flake off into the wind and remind me of the time that I spent in the military here. The sounds of steel slamming together is generously nostalgic. Goats bleat as their owners attempt to auction them off to the mercantile denizens of the wealthy district. As we walk up to the castle bridge, we are met with what I assume to be our fellow warriors. The first individual that catches my eye is a half-orc. 
On his forehead appears to be a branded rune put backwards, a straight line with a triangle in the center of it, facing to the left, as opposed to the correct right. A symbol of betrayal, it seems. Or exile, possibly. Either way, it's a prominent scar on his olive green skin. There are white, orcish markings on the entirety of his body, which is covered with a set of leather armor that has been wrapped in various furs. His tusks are rounded and dulled, filed down to the size of a small cork. His eyes are dark, but empty. Not in a soulless way, but more of a drool running down the side of his chin sort of way. He carries with him a, a set of matching hand axes with ribbons at the bottom of the handle. He might not be the best person to piss off. He's very muscular. The next individual that I notice is a shorter half-elf, standing at around 5'5". Five five. I might have mistaken him for a drow, how I, had I ever seen one before. He sports flowing black hair with silver eyes. He boasts an air of superiority, with a glance that could kill the mightiest of Owlbear. This elven figure wears a set of darkened, studded leather armor, and an elven longsword at the ready. Despite being in the city next to the guards, he holds it over his shoulder competently. This is strange, however. His figure is wildly scrawny and thin. I'm not sure that he knows how to use that thing, but I could also be very wrong. It'd be wise of me to scope out the party here and figure out who I can make laugh as quickly as possible. This man is certainly someone I should never underestimate. Three more individuals remain, and two of them seem to be an obvious pair. The leader between the two is a very young woman with blonde hair pulled into a tight braided bun. She wears a set of darkened steel blade armor with red accented undertones. Sheathed and at the ready is a matching longsword with runic inscriptions. Her demeanor is calm and collected, juggling superiority and respect among her peers. She is a lower ranking knight of the Royal Arganian military, someone whom I instantly have respect towards. She's leagues above where I was years ago. The individual at her side is obviously her retainer, a younger man with a soft face and gentle curly brown hair. His eyes are pure and his smile instantly upgrades the intimidation factor on his royal boss. The impurities on his face suggest he's no older than 17 at the most. This little warrior has a buckler and a mace alongside a set of leather armor. In situations like these, young aspiring soldiers are sometimes granted the boon of following around a, a much higher official to train and assist them with their needs. A squire. At first it confused me as to why she was here and not on duty with the military somewhere. It was then that I realized she was a freelance militia unit, serving active duty on any call to arms when needed. Otherwise she was free to wander around as she pleases, within the quota of law bringing. The final individual here is an austere, grim woman. She stands somewhat taller than the knight at her side, but it's obvious that she's the odd one out of the whole group. She wears a set of black leather armor that functions as an assassin's jumpsuit, providing the maximum protection for the maximum range of motion. She has decorative metal plates on her shoulders and knees. She wears a matching set of metal gauntlets that trail to her hands, and have sharp interlocking plates that cover her fingers. On her thighs are multiple daggers, as well as a cloak that hides her obvious set of weapons at her hip. These are entirely obscured. Her lips are pale, as well as her skin, with dark purple war makeup around her eyes. Her figure is very seductive. She takes a deep breath and ignores all of us, clutching the letter in her hands, crossing her arms and waiting. I would be able to make out what she wields if the cloak didn't entirely conceal them. If I'll be honest, she terrifies me, and I should be cautious. With this, the seven of us awkwardly gather together and begin small talk, quietly understanding we will be working together on whatever the queen wants from us. Taking the initiative, I begin to shake everyone's hand. Hey, uh, <laughs> my name is Rumem, and uh, I'm looking forward to working with you all. My wrinkly friend wiggles his shell and tap dances the best his sharp little feet will let him. My name is Franklin Stinklin, and I make a mean gumbo, the kind that'll leave your precious little mouthies craving for more. Also, my mouth is magic, and helps you, strong ass, scary ass, black hair having ass, sharp nose, dark armor, edgy ass type people, ass. The half-elf takes a deep breath in and purses his lips, raising his chin slightly, 
Good morning to all of you. My name is Alem, and that's all you need to know from me right now. It's a pleasure to make your acquaintance. The half-orc behemoth jets in. My name is Thok. If I hit something hard enough, I split it in half. That's bones and skulls, blood and pain. Also, I like long walks on the beach. And gumbo. Please make me gumbo. The knight and her retainer stand tall and shake everyone's hands. Hello, my name is Alta, and it's a pleasure to meet you all. I'm a freelance royal knight for the queen here. This is my student. The young man nods and shakes her hands wildly. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Alexander, but you can just call me Alex. It's a pleasure to meet you all, and I look forward to working with you guys. The scary onyx hair girl finally speaks, directing everyone's attention at once. My name is Evelyn, and that's all. I'm not looking to make friends, and I'm not looking to make enemies. Thok, the half-orc, and Franklin, the turtle, exchange a goofy look in response. With this, we exchange small talk and theorize on what's to happen when we meet the queen. The most popular idea is that there's a big old monster harassing a farm that we need to kill. With this, the gate guards alert us that it's officially time for us to enter the castle. He checks the validity of each of our personalized letters and nods. The drawbridge begins to lower with heavy creaking and mechanical clicking. As we cross over the bridge, I glance towards the crystal clear water beneath us in the moat. Falling in there might be deadly. The outside of the castle is white with the holy colors of uh, the accenting red. The banners of the city flap on either side of the entrance. The symbol is that of a boar with wings, similar to what I have. As we walk inside, the place seems to be the source of the floral sin throughout the district and uh, of the city. There are lavender planter boxes aligning the sides of the walls. Beneath our feet lay a long velvet carpet over a gentle birch-colored wooden floor. Royal guards stand at the ready, stationed in pairs of twos. The queen is incredibly well protected here. The main chamber is maybe 30 feet long, leading up to the throne where Queen Jade sits atop, which is adorned with several jewels and gold threading. On either side of the walkway, there are tables with various nobles, militants and diplomatic representatives discussing various aspects of settlements. Queen Jade sits before us with her hands on her lap. Her chocolate brown hair rests braided onto her shoulders and trails down her back. She wears a lavender purple dress with gold lace around the trim, as well as an elaborate silver necklace that stretches across her collarbone, fitted with a large sapphire jewel in the center. She smiles at us and quietly analyzes us. Franklin whispers, Oh golly, that necklace is worth more than I've ever spent in a brothel. Actually, I think I might be able to buy one with it. I glance over. Shh. Don't be rude. Uh, have you ever actually been to a brothel? No, but my previous statement still stands. Fair enough, I reply. With this, Alum, the half-elf, takes a quick bow and drops to a knee. Soon after, Alter and Alex do the same as well, cueing all of us to follow suit. I'd be lying if I wasn't a little nervous to be back in the city with the whole deserting from the military thing. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You know what? I'm definitely going to worry about it, but I'll be quiet about it. Queen Jade touches her fingertips together. Good afternoon, my warriors. I have requested for your audience today to discuss a matter of business that ends with a grand reward. As many of you may have heard, I wish to end the war. I promise 200 gold pieces to each one of you who participates and succeeds in my task. I wish for you to protect and deliver my Prince Blake, as well as the letter of truce to the ruler of Mythal, King Onvir. Your task is simple, to be the bodyguards and witness to a change in history. It is urgent that we deliver this letter and that you all work together. That's why I have elected that you start to get to know each other for this journey. I have set it up with one of the finer establishments Ardinia has to offer for you to spend the night. There are rooms for you to stay in that would otherwise be pricey to afford. Consider it my treat. Each of us looked at each other with bewilderment, understanding the much larger task at hand and appreciating her benevolence. We will be leaving tomorrow at approximately 9am. 
you will have two hooded carts, and these will be camouflaged. I am aware of the dangers of the road, so we will have purposefully beaten up the cars to give it the visage of a carriage that's not covered in gold, if you catch my drift. Was that it? That was pretty to the point. Queen Jade claps her hands together and out pops her tiny assistant, Mira, a petite brown-haired girl in a fine dress. She approaches with a tiny box full of tokens, it seems. We are told to give this to the receptionist of the Blue Moon Inn for a free night of lodging. I am beside myself in appreciation. Alter the Knight bows and thanks the Queen, to which we all follow some similar gesture of appreciation and respect. As we're being escorted out, Franklin turns to Evelyn and says, Two hundred gold pieces? Do you know how much pink lipstick and perfume you could buy? The angry dark shadow lady turns to him and squints her eyes. Do you know how much more money I can make selling turtle stew? Man, I really hope that I go for more than a few copper pieces because woo wee, am I worth like three copper a bite? Alum the half-elf looks over and says, well, if we invest at least a few hundred gold pieces into a restaurant, we could exclusively sell turtle soup, while supplies last. All y'all bitches ain't totally enough for the turtle club. Over the next few minutes, everyone hits it off with everybody else in a similar banter while I tune it out and think of the course of action over the next few days. We would be part of something that would be historically catastrophic. We would end the war. By the gods, everything that I thought over the last few weeks would finally happen, and I would be the one doing it. In fact, I tuned out the entirety of the stay of the, at the inn. The room was fantastic and so was the food. Uh, it felt super awkward being there. It's been itchy beds and dirty floors for most of my life. These sheets are satin. Thank you, Jade. By the next morning, we were already at the castle again and in front of the queen. The night had gone by so quickly I hadn't even realized. In any case, we were escorted to the royal stables where we were introduced to our friends for this trip. There are two royal guards who have been dressed up in what some might call common gear. This is supposed to be a covert operation, so I suppose that I understand the necessary poor precautions. If we were to travel across the forest as a beacon of gold and wealth, we might be attacked. The guards are rather sizable, considering the condition that they used to be in. The paint has been scratched off and the wheels have been chipped. Overall, it seems like any old hooded cart. The inside, however, is the same as it was. Plush seating, plenty of leg room. Wonderful. The two guards hop down from the coach and introduce themselves. The differences in age are staggering. The first to speak is a fine gentleman with a sporting white mustache. The wrinkles in his brow and scars on his arm indicate years of service. Truly a veteran to the queen. He has a large spear and splint armor. Smiling wide beneath his facial hair, he says, Good morning to all of you. My name is Marcus, and I will be helming the prince's cart. If you need anything from me, all you need to do is ask. I'll see what these old bones can do. We all shook his hand and introduced ourselves. The other guard is a much younger individual with shorter brown hair. He's a little older than Alex, but similar in vibe. This young man wears a set of chainmail armor with a short sword of the ready. His face, dis his face is soft, but rigid in a heroic sort of way. His bright blue eyes sing youth and hope. This is absolutely the mission for him. Hey guys, thank you all for joining us on this journey. My name is Fenton, and it's a pleasure to meet all of you. I'll be steering your cart here. Don't you worry about a thing. We've got your back through all of this. He pumps his fist and slaps the side of the hooded wagon, leaning on it for support. Thok, the half-orc, pipes up. So, uh, how will this work? When do we meet the prince, and uh, how, many of, how many of us per cart? Oh, you know what? That's wonderful that you asked. Um, everyone will be in one cart, and Prince Blake will be in this one. He points to the other caravan, which is identical in appearance, except for the fact that there's a door in the back of it, and the inside seems to be a tiny room, as opposed to benches. He also said that he'll be staying there until nightfall. Alum, the half-elf, 
shifts on his feet and crosses his arms. So you're expecting us to escort the prince a few dozen miles south without seeing him first. That sounds a bit rude, I might add. I don't know that I would trust starting off a quest like this without fully meeting our client, especially if 200 gold pieces are on the line for this. That's just unreasonable at this point. Do I sound uptight about this, anyone? Surely someone would agree with me. Fenton stammers for a few seconds, and his face looks pale. Franklin rests his hand on the pommel of his sheathed sword and pushes it back and forth, swinging it wildly past his hips. Yeah, no, uh, no. I totally agree with Edgy here. This is a whole lot of moolah, and I wouldn't take kindly to being lied to. Would it be lying if he didn't talk to us? Alter, the freelance Dark Knight, speaks up. Well, if I shall say something quick. The prince is free to do whatever the prince so chooses to do. And if that includes dillying off and ignoring us the whole time, all it would do is harp on our relationship with him and taint our reliability on each other. How could we be expected to have the back of someone who treats us as dirt for anything beyond the money we receive at the end of it? That would leave us begrudging and unwilling. I have met the prince before, but I will not speak on his behalf. He is but a boy expected to be an adult. He will make the decisions he chooses. Now, I'm not defending nor dampening the kid, but he's going to have to make a choice eventually. At the cost of his protection, fueled with passion, not money. Evelyn raises her eyebrows slightly and bobs her head, agreeing with Alter. Alex seems to have stars in his eyes, listening to his idol speak. Speaking up myself, I say, I agree. How Walter holds herself is indicative of her status as a royal knight and a wise woman. I really don't see why we should force ourselves upon this since we get paid in the end anyway. We have a war to stop and civilians to save. And this is our one opportunity to fix something for the thousands of innocents who have been caught up in the scenery. Let's move out, everyone. Alum the half-elf twitches his nose indicating that he's upset with the outcome, but accepting of Alta's words. All right, fine. We should discuss a strategy while we are traveling, to best suit the possible outcomes and be prepared for the rebel on the road. Sounds good, Thok replies, staring at the horses who dig impatiently at the cobbled stone beneath them. With this, we find ourselves seating inside the cart, with the light crack of a whip. We are on our way out of the city and into the lush forests I used to call home. I feel hopeful at the moment. This could be our chance to change the region forever. After discussing our current party, it has come down to this. All of us are melee fighters. Thok, Alex, Evelyn, and I are short-range combatants. Alter and Alum are medium-range spell swords, utilizing some offensive magic and a weapon. Franklin is our support capable of using a sword and casting magic that might help us in battle. As far as our melee capability goes, Thok is a frontline fighter, a berserker who wields axes. I use a longsword, Alex uses a mace and shield, while Evelyn uses daggers and strikes from surprise. Alum wields a longsword and casts evocation magic, as he is so confident about. Alter does precisely the same. Franklin uses a short sword, but also many supporting spells like Healing Word. If needed, Thok can throw the axes, and Evelyn can throw the knives. Not the best case scenario against archer bandits, but it should be alright. Especially against landlocked monsters. We talked about this for a few hours and made small talk. We haven't known each other for long enough to talk about deeper, more revealing topics, but it certainly passes the time having a bunch of us. Over the course of today's travels, it is wildly boring, and I saw a deer once. With the sky darkening, we eventually veer off into the woods, into a wide, old campsite. The coals in the pit are cold, and the campsite is generally neglected. Leaves are blown all over the place, and moss covers the sitting logs. The two guards hop off the cart and immediately get to work. They open the door of the closed cart where the prince is, and they come out to start assembling a ginormous tent. In between events, they start to clean up the camp, sifting the fireplace and wiping their brow with sweat. It hasn't even been a minute, and they're multitasking to high hell. I blinked maybe twice, and half of the campsite was already ready to go. 
despite the seven of us stretching our legs. The small fire crackles under the fuel of the dried campsite leaves. These guys are practically sprinting. Franklin stretches backwards and yawns. Y'all need to slow down a crunch. You're moving faster than me on a Tuesday. Thok looks over, puzzled. What are you doing on Tuesday? Bingo. Oh. Soon after, the door of the caravan opens and out walks a young teenage boy, around maybe 15. He wears a fine set of clothes, different shades of muted red. His hair is short and blonde, while his eyes are a bright blue. Good afternoon, everyone. You all did a splendid job on your first night. Save your rations, for I have a treat for all of you. For the first night and the first night only, we will provide food for you. You can thank me later. Sit back and protect me like you were hired to do. Guards, is my tent ready? Marcus replies with a heavy sigh. He says, Yes, my prince. Alum looks as though he's going to poop himself, and Evelyn rolls her eyes hardcore. Alter takes a seat on one of the moss benches and smiles lightly, as if to audibly say, Yeah, I know. Not long after, Fenton prepares the now roaring fire with a cauldron. He begins to assemble the ingredients needed for a beef stew that would feed a dozen. Prince Blake marches his little ass into the ten-foot-long tent and shuffles around his belongings. After a few seconds of silence, I glance over to Fenton and catch the look of utter exhaustion. They were being worked to death. This is unacceptable, so I stood up and took a deep breath. <sighs> All right, listen up, guys. This is enough. Fenton, Marcus... Sit down. You guys have done plenty and should take the night off. We aren't just bodyguards and I can't expect the two of you to do literally everything around here. I'll handle cooking the food. I want two people on collecting firewood, one person on setting up bedrolls, one person to scout out the area, another to, to collect some water for me in the camp, and the other to remain on sentry duty. Thok nods his head aggressively and gestures for them to stop working. I'll do firewood with Franklin. I nodded to him and looked at Fenton, who quietly weeps a thank you and collapses into the sitting log. Marcus shakes my hand and mutters something about the youngins he's working with being a lot more helpful than his own kids. Evelyn agrees to scouting. Alum situates, every, situates everyone's bedding, Alex is working on water, and Alter stands alert for sentry duty. This makes me happy. Everyone willing to be productive and helpful, where they can right off the bat. We seem to unite on two things. Prince Blake is an asshole, and the guards can't do all the work. Pretty soon, the sound of cicadas echo through the woods, and the gentle forest breeze rattles our bones. Every once in a while, I have to smack a mosquito off of me, but the smoke does a really great job of preventing that. The scent of stew fills the air, and the collective grumble of stomachs warms my heart. Thok and Franklin came back with a freaking deer. He claims to have thrown an axe at it, which is evident by the deep laceration in its, ne in its neck. The damn thing died quick. I laugh it off, and between the two of us we ration out the meat for the next few days. This should be enough to feed us for the rest of the trip there. We divide up our watch for the night and, conclu and conclude this evening's rest successfully and quietly. As the early morning birds sing their songs, a gentle dew collects on our campsite. Stretches and early morning routines lead to the packing up of our camp and the continuation of our journey. It was only a few hours into our travels when I heard something that made my heart drop. The cart comes to a grinding stop. Greetings, travelers. You lot seem new around here, and with that, we have come to say hello. We do not wish to harm you in any way. We have just come to take your caravan and leave. So how about it, you old white caterpillar? I was nauseous. You're kidding me, right? This is a nightmare and I'm still dreaming. While I was shaking, I sat there frozen, sweating bullets and swallowing hard. It couldn't be. 
Thok made a huge frown and drew his weapons, stepping out of the caravan and onto the battlefield. Soon after, the rest of us flooded out and dispersed throughout the attack. Looking at the ambush, there's about 15 of them in total, men, who all seem to be human. All of them are in heavily worn and slightly damaged gear. They're covered head to toe in dirty, wet, and rugged leather and metal armor. Two of these individuals stick out as the obvious muscle. They have maces, and taller than everybody else, but everybody else seems to have dented or rusted scimitars. All of them looked like they needed a bath weeks ago, but pose a deadly threat regardless. We're outnumbered, so if a fight broke out, we would be toast. I held my longsword and squeezed the handle as hard as I could, gritting my teeth. Evelyn lowers her head slightly and unbuckles the cloak, obscuring her main weapons. She draws forth a dual set of bone-white daggers in the shape of a great beast's tooth. They are razor-sharp and glimmery, crimson sheen, indicating these are obviously enchanted. They're huge, too. The damn things must weigh a lot. What seems to be the leader of the shoddy bandit steps forward. The man is half-elven, wearing a tanned set of leather armor, donning multiple slash marks engraved into the hide. On his braces are tallies of different carvings. His hair is a disgusting blonde, caked in a layer of dirt, grime, and grease. His nose is massive and crooked on his sunken in, accentuated features. His chin is pointed, and his jawline is cut. His smile produces a corn-yellow cracked set of orange and black teeth, stained from years of alcohol and tobacco. He's well over six foot tall, lean and broad. All over his skin are scars. This is fucking Magnus, the man who killed my mother. Well, aren't you a beautiful set of weirdos? Might I make myself clear? I asked for your stuff, and I won't kill you. Perhaps you're a little light in the ears. Hell, there's a couple of cuties among you. Would be a hell of a shame if we got to you. Marcus drew his weapon and holds out his hands. I'm afraid that I can't do that for you. You need to reevaluate your thinking and move on, boy. You don't want to do this. Boy, what do I look like to you? Listen up, you old fuck. I got a family to feed and you're my prey. You're in my way, bug. It's the end of the line for you. You've got to the count of three to drop your weapon or there's gonna be blood. Ahem. One. All of us brace ourselves and look around. Around the battlefield, the bandits are dispersed evenly through the tree line and with some high ground in between. There's six archers, two brutes, six swords, and Magnus. I currently stand on the right side of the caravan exit, with Magnus to my back. Two. The bandits knock their arrows and aim it at us. Franklin mutters a few arcane words and gently touches Thok with a feather. Not a second later does his green skin glimmer with a brief yellow glow and the veins on his entire body bulge. He takes a deep breath in and billows out in a furious war cry, raising his two axes and throwing them at the same time. At once, they fly through the air and split the freaking chest open of one of the archers and split the skull of one of the swordsmen, spraying the area with blood as they crumple down onto the ground. He laughs explosively and the battle is on. Arrows fly through the air an arrow whizzes past my ear and bounces off a of Franklin's shell. One of them sinks into Thok's arm, but he doesn't even notice. The clang of metal is heard as Alter's sword whips through the air and deflects the arrow towards the dirt. Instantly, we spread out and single out who we can. I have two on me, Aelum with one, Thok with one of the brutes, Alter and Alex with the other brute, Franklin and Evelyn attempting to kill the archers while fighting off the remaining bandits. Fenton and Marcus take either side of the entrance of Blake's cabin with the remaining bandits on them. Magnus draws his weapon slowly and walks forward, analyzing the situation. The second round of arrows. A yell is heard as one of them pierces through Alum's leg and he drops down to one knee. One of them sinks into my breastplate but is stopped short before reaching my chest. I shout out a curse and snap the arrow, fighting off the relentless blows from the bandits. My sword smashes into another, guiding the blade down into the dirt. I quickly glance over as Thok is trying desperately to collect his axes. A second goes by as he looks away and at once, the brute clobbers the absolute shit out of him with the mace. A snap is heard as the weapon bludgeons his arm. He shouts out in pain and rage, ripping the dripping axes out of the human carcass and trades blows once more. 
Franklin quickly swipes away a, another swipe and shoots his gaze over to Alter, who is fighting next to him. All right, my nighty night, I'll bark no bite. Show me what you could really do with the blade in your boobs. For a moment, Alter seems inspired and challenged by his words, and thrusts her sword forward, slashing the arm of the brute and dancing around the wild swing of the mace. As Franklin is talking to Alter, a scimitar comes down and cuts deep into his chest, dripping blood onto the ground. Oh, holy crap, my good golly gosh, you son of a bitch. You're a real bitch. Have some bitch-ass spicy air, you bitch! Not a second later do his eyes flash red and the bandit is instantly ignited into flames. He screams out and drops his sword, falling to the ground and clogging at his skin. The screams quickly fade away as he withers away into a pile of ash. Some of the bandits are leery of this and step away from him as they cry out to the archers. Franklin clutches his chest as a shit ton of arrows sink deep into the turtle and he falls unconscious, bleeding out onto the ground. Hey, Franklin is down! I shout. Alum desperately raises his heavy sword to block blow after blow. He struggles to swing the sword wildly, missing strike after strike. Sweat pours down his brow as he heaves through. As of right now, they're just fighting behind Thok and the Brute. The behemoth of a bandit drops his mace for a second and shoves Thok back a few feet and slams into the cart, causing him to swear and grit his teeth. The Brute spins around and grabs Alum by the back of his neck, lifting him up a few feet and slamming down onto the ground. Alum shouts and coughs blood onto himself as he holds his hands up to the bandit who starts kicking him in the ribs. He doubles over and groans. Hey! Alum's down now too! I call out. Evelyn easily ducks around the feeble swings of a dagger as her own fang dagger sinks deep into the chest of the archer, dropping him down onto the ground. She spins around and charges towards another archer who looses an arrow into Thok. This time he must have felt that one as he drops down to one knee, wounded. The brute picks up his mace again and goes for another blow. This time, the orcrit's berserker cannot deflect this one and crumbles under the crushing blow of the bludgeon. Alex shouts out, Thok is down, guys! Alter cleaves the stomach of the brute she is fighting with the tip of her longsword. About halfway through the swing, she shouts out an incantation and the runes on her, gl on her sword glow a crimson red. From the tip of the blade shoots a flume of fire that incinerates the shit out of the brute and cauterizes the wound as it cuts. Alex then instantly jumps forward and punches him in the jaw with the butt of his, of his shield, shooting the brute's head backwards and knocking him unconscious. I glance back towards my contenders and drop to one knee, spearheading, spearheading the tip of my blade into the thin part of their armor, dropping them down onto the ground. The others remain fixated on me, where we continue to trade by, back and forth. As of right now, four archers, one brute, and three swords remain. Franklin, Alum, and Thok are down right now. Shit. I shoot my gaze backwards to see Fenton and Marcus fighting Magnus. He batters into them with a flurry of dual-wielded strikes that quickly befall Fenton. Marcus calls out to everyone that he has fallen moments before receiving a pommel strike to the nose, knocking him unconscious into a pool of blood. I relay this information to everybody where Magnus jumps over the cart and towards Alter. Uh, Alter! On your left. I am suddenly interrupted with an arrow in my chest and a sword denting my gauntlet into a bruise. I curse and lash my fist out, clocking him in the side of the face and knocking him to the ground. I snap the arrow off and turn to my friends, where Magnus jumps down onto Alter from the top of the caravan. Flesh tears as she screams in pain, falling to the ground on one knee. Alex takes this opportunity to rush over to Franklin and bandage him up as quickly as he can, tearing off pieces of his shirt to stabilize some of the bleeding. I charge over the Magnus and jump on, jump into the air, planting my metal boots clean into his nasty fucking face. Drop kicking him into a tree. Ow! That fucking hurt you, shithead! Collecting myself, I jumped back up and readied my weapon, leaning forward into a haymaker that dents the side of his cheekbone. Locking eyes with him and staring into his soul, I spat. By the gods around us, I thought I'd never hear your damned voice again. Evelyn shakes her head and grits her teeth. Fine. Is this how we're going to play this now? Fuck you all. She takes her daggers and slams the pommels together, muttering to herself the word, Ixen. Her daggers instantly ignite into a blowtorch-style, angelically white flame. The daggers hiss with an eruptive fire as she lashes out with another attack towards the remaining archers. Her blade sinks into the archer's neck, causing the flesh to rapidly incinerate and flake away into a pile of dust within seconds. 
The man screams out in pain as he withers away into nothing. She darts around with an extreme speed, using the ground to acrobatically launch herself into the chest of the brute and stabilize herself by sinking the daggers into either side of his shoulder meat. The fire sears his flesh, and she finishes him off by slamming her forehead into the bridge of his nose, breaking it in the process and withering away his body. If I had the time, I would be horrified. Alum, still being kicked and beaten, whispers a plea out like a frightened child. For a moment, he flashes a glance of surprise on his face and attempts to brush away the dirt in his eyes. His nose is bleeding, and his whole body is covered in a thick layer of bruises. His left arm is broken, and his shin seems caved in. The half-elf glares up at the bandit and snarls. His eyes flash purple for a second as he shoots his hand forward and etherealizes a mass of swirling, kinetic energy that blasts force and slams into the bandit's face, causing an explosion of brain matter and bones that kick his armor and wounds. He seems both horrified and excited at the same time. He cackles maniacally and smiles wide between the desperate attempts at breathing. Arm limp and doubled over in agony, Alum raises his hand once more and releases more of these kinetic purple blasts of energy that slam into the remaining bandits and cause an equivalent amount of mayhem, rendering them in bloody pieces or unconscious. All the while, he explodes into evil laughter and excitement. With Alum and Evelyn's efforts, all that remain is Magnus. While he recovers from my fist, I shout to everyone else, Tender their wounds and make sure everyone's okay. Leave him to me. Alum twitches and falls to his knee, passing out onto the dirt. This leaves Alex and Evelyn to, stab to stabilize everyone now. Again? Now tell me this, kid. Why in the bloody blazes would I remember you? Magnus recovers and unleashes a whirlwind of strikes. Blow after blow, I redirect and dodge, before he throws his one scimitar into the air, drops to one knee, and draws a jagged dagger that punctures the back of my leg. He leaves it there and catches his flying sword. I take this opportunity to go, to go onto the offensive and land a blow on the side of his face. I grit my teeth and sink my fist into his mouth again. Terenzian, two decades ago, you killed my fucking mother. Do you have any idea what that did to me? You're that pissant who stabbed me. You just don't bloody leave, do ya? Oh, I spared your life and you came back to bite me in the ass. When I had my way with your mother, oh, I thought I'd settle things. Maybe you disappear into the city and stay there. Maybe die in a gutter for all the shits that I give, but fuck me if I find my goddamn son at the end of the blade. Man, you're a freaking headache, you know that? I took a step back for a moment. My eyes went wide. What do you mean? Means I'm dear old Pop, the father that you never had. Whatever. Wish I wasn't, and I won't be for long. The hell did you expect? Your mother was quite the looker. Are you gonna tell me that you never actually knew? Rometta didn't tell ya. Thought it was quite obvious, really. Mom and boy made a creep. Mother fights him off. Complains about me taking advantage again. Blah, 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 the works, if you know what I mean. Honestly, if you didn't see it coming, you deserve to be heard by it. With this, he kicks the dagger in my leg and drops me to my knee. I flare my nostrils and grit my teeth. Magnus cuts deep past my armor and sends shards flying to the ground. I yell in pain. She was harassing me to take up responsibility, but I didn't feel like doing that. It doesn't work that way in my eyes. Just kind of suck it up, I guess. Daddy annoying the fucking thing. It's just a fucking kid. No big deal. Oh, I've got plenty of those. Came back to the town to clean up the loose ends, and there you were with your glass. You caught me deep, kid. Go fuck yourself. Rounded up the local boys and partied like hell after we burned the place to the ground. There were hundreds of things that I wanted to say. Things that could cut deep. Things to retaliate with. But I couldn't manage a single one. I was trapped in my head between a blind rage and vengeance for my mother. The best that I could manage to respond with is nothing. Silence. I launch myself upwards, fighting through the pain and choking back the tears that sting worse than any of my wounds. My longsword plunges through his stomach and out the other side, embedding itself into the tree behind him. While he struggles there, pinned in place, I ball my fist and slam them into his teeth, 
My knuckles are broken and bleeding, but I pump my rage one after another, pulverizing his face with each strike. Everything is numb. Tears stream down my face as I remain uncomfortably silent. Eventually, his head deflates beneath my feeble blows. Silence falls upon the forest as the wildlife rears in horror into my absolution. The squelching of my knuckles battering into the pulp of my father echo through, my, through the road. My ears ring and my mind is flooded with memories of my mother. What could have been. The hugs that I'll never get again. I sobbed myself as Evelyn pulls me off of him and bullies my fury into further disassociation. I can't even hear her. Shaky breaths and an overall numbness, I whisper. I love you, Mom. <laughs>